and welcome to tonight's public hearing. This hearing includes Columbus City Council's Health and Human Services, Finance and Workforce Development Committees. I am Council Member Priscilla Tyson and I am Chair of those committees. Before we begin, please be aware that this hearing is being recorded for rebroadcast on CTV, the Columbus Government Television Channel 3. The rebroadcast schedule is available at www.columbus.gov. Tonight's hearing is one in a series of bi-weekly committee hearings that I hold in order to review legislation in the committees that I chair. This includes Health and Human Services, Finance, and the Workforce Development Committees. The goal of these hearings is to promote transparency and provide an opportunity for city residents to learn and to speak on legislation that impacts their lives. There will be on occasions when a committee is not covered because legislation is not always scheduled for each committee. The intent of each hearing is to review legislation that will be on the City Council's agenda for the following two weeks. Tonight we will hear information on legislation in Health and Human Services and in the Finance Committees that will be on the Council agenda on July 13th. And before I get ready to introduce the speakers on the agenda, I want to introduce my intern for um, this summer, my summer intern. His name is Jordan Harrison, and he is a senior at Eastmore Academy, which is my high school. And he is um, going to major when he's, he's, a, he's a senior there, and he hopes to... Um, attend college and focus on computer science. He's also the president of the um, NASB group, which is the National Society of Black Engineers, a student group in Columbus. So I'm excited to have him on my team. Thank you, Jordan. And so tonight we have several speakers. Um, the first we have Speaker Paul Rakowski, who's the Director of Finance and Management. We also have Ms. Debbie Klee, who is our City Treasurer. We have Melinda Frank, who was our Income Tax Division Administrator who, from the Auditor's Office and the Income Tax Division. We have Ro Roger Clone, who is the Assistant Health Commissioner from the Columbus Public Health. We will begin the legislation in the Finance Committee by asking Director Rakowski to provide us with the updates on the legislation in his department. Director Rakowski, the floor is yours. Good evening, Chair Tyson. Uh, the first ordinance that I'm going to uh, speak to is one that we really have had before uh, this legislative committee in a previous meeting. It's 1196-2015. And as you know, we've recently implemented new sections of Chapter 329 as it relates to the construction code. Uh, and uh, as we've moved through the implementation of that, would there have been needs to clarify certain instances in that code. This ordinance had been presented at an earlier date, but we have had to add to this ordinance based on uh, the bids that we received for our new construction project at uh, 111 Front Street for our new building. And I'll speak to the need for the bid waiver in regard to that legislation. But what we've added to this piece, there's a lot of clarifying work that we've done that we spoke to earlier in regard to the definition of construction and uh, removing a reference to bonding capacity in sections that are not relative to our pre-qualification process, changing the word bid to performance as it relates to performance guarantees. Uh, but we have added a section clarifying the process related to the bidding of subcontractors, and I'll speak to that in more detail when we get to the other ordinance. Uh, we have asked for the first time really ever for construction contractors to provide their subcontractors up front in regard to their bids. Uh, generally, they would be providing these after the bidding process. Uh, they would provide us with a price on their bid for the different sections of work, but they were never required to provide uh, the names of the subcontractors that were going to do that work. So uh, we're going to clarify that in regard to this ordinance by asking for more specificity that matches either the bid documents themselves or our construction uh, material specification manual. So we've worked with the city attorney on that change and we believe that's going to clarify uh, some of the issues that we had with the bid that I'll speak to a little bit later. And then again, it, this ordinance clarified some language in regard to the sale and lease of city-owned uh, realty, which really aligns it with Ordinance 1102-2005, which 
really establish the real estate management office which in the within the finance department. So it's really a change that just matches the code to current practice. Uh, and again, I'll speak uh, a little bit uh, further down the line about the need for the one uh, additional clarification here in the code related to the subcontractors. So in relationship to the sun, subcontractors in the past, they could, um, an individual who wanted to do work with the city in terms of construction could just could submit their bid and um, for a certain price and knowing that we're going to have to have subcontractors to work on the construction project and they didn't have to list the name, didn't have to list the businesses on the contract prior to bidding, is that correct? That's correct and then they would establish those after the fact and one of the changes that we made in the city's code was to get away from that, basically to try and get away from bid shopping of uh, folks that would give a good faith effort on their price to only have that price then replaced at a later date by uh, basically working against that good faith vendor by going to somebody else and saying if you could provide a lower price that we would take that. So the intent of the code was to get rid of that practice as I'll speak to you again later when I speak to the other ordinance, I think that we accomplished that goal, uh, but we needed to clarify that language so that uh, we were getting exactly the, the information that we wanted to get because we don't want to have to waive in regard to these large projects. All right, thank you. Next ordinance is 1607-2015. Uh, this is an ordinance that allows the finance and management director to create various purchase orders. These are for automotive parts on behalf of the fleet management uh, division. And this is the parts that we use to repair and service city vehicles and to properly respond to both planned but also unexpected emergencies that may arise in regard to the maintenance uh, and repair of city vehicles. Uh, during 2015, we're budgeted to spend in excess of 4.3 million for parts and over 1.3 million for services to keep the city's fleet of approximately 6,000 vehicles in operation. Uh, fleet management processes over 40,000 work orders annually for all city vehicles and equipment and requires purchase orders with over 400 vendors to meet this need. Uh, so again, we have an operating budget that contains over 5.6 million for the purchase of automotive parts, supplies, and services. And this legislation will authorize an expenditure of 400,000 with various vendors, and that's all based on existing UTCs that we have out there. So it's 400,000 of our overall 5.6 million for various parts and services for uh, maintaining the city's fleet. Thank you. Uh, the next uh, piece of legislation is 1733-2015. Uh, this legislation authorizes the finance and management director to modify a contract with Unifirst Corporation to add uh, items 30A through 34D. This is per solicitation number SA005786, rental of uniforms and building maintenance supplies. Uh, in Ordinance 1127-2015, City Apparel was awarded items 30A through 34D. Uh, however, after accepting the award, the supplier determined they could not fulfill their obligations of the contract. And even though this speaks to uniform rental and building maintenance supplies, these are really mats that we use at various city facilities. So when those mats become dirty, we have the company comes back out and replaces the dirty mats with clean mats and then takes the dirty mats away and then cleans those and brings them to another facility. Uh, this, uh, the vendor that we did award this to was charging us on both ends of that process. That is not the way uh, that we have the contract written. You do not charge us to take the dirty mats away and then charge us to bring the clean ones. It's one charge for that. We have not paid any of those invoices under the current uh, contract, but we're gonna go ahead and modify the contract, go with the, under, the other vendor for the provision of these mats and the cleaning of these mats. And then we are currently uh, reviewing all of our invoices from this company to ensure that we're not gonna double pay for any of these services. So that's the need for the modification and change in regard to this ordinance. Thank you, and so the um, so, and Unifer, Unifirst Corporation was our bid on this also, correct? That's correct, and they were the, the second 
lowest bidder, but there's a reason because they're not charging us for both ends of that uh, process of removing and cleaning the mat. So we're going to go with the uh, UNA first as our, our vendor to do the mats. Thank you. Uh, the next ordinance is the ordinance I mentioned earlier. It's 1792-2015. This legislation authorizes the finance and management director to enter in a contract on behalf of our Office of Construction Management with Messer Construction Company in an amount of $73,750,000 for the construction of a new office building. Uh, this will be located at uh, 111 North Front Street and a new parking garage to be located at 141 North Front Street. As you're well aware, the city demolished the former 109 Front Street building in 2014. It was due to uh, the really the inefficiency of that building and its functional uh, obsolescence. Uh, this new building that we have designed and now will begin to construct, it's going to unite four separate uh, service departments, what we've called our one-stop shop over the course of time, public service development, building and zoning, and a portion of the public utilities uh, department. Again, uh, we will put these all together in one building to really for the first time formally uh, put our one-stop shop together. Uh, this group provides a myriad of business regulatory neighborhood and code functions. Uh, the building that we've designed is targeted for lead silver. Uh, as such, we'll have a natural and energy efficient building. Um, that it will uh, use uh, natural lighting, uh, reduced uh, water flow components, high performance heating and cooling equipment. Uh, it will employ recycled products, reflective roof coatings, and actually on this building, on a portion of the building, we'll have a green roof. It'll be our first uh, use of a green roof uh, in something that's being constructed through the construction management office. Um, obviously, we'll be using low. Uh, VOC paints and sealants, and as I said, a permanent green space, uh, not only on the roof, but also in our current surface lot will be replaced with a urban uh, green space that uh, all the visitors to the building and the workers here in the City Hall campus will be able to enjoy. Uh, by bringing these functions together, we'll eliminate the need for residents and businesses and within the community to travel among various locations as they currently have to do. Uh, so as an example, if you were looking to obtain a certified address, a building permit, new water and sewer connections, and all fee payments, you can do this now uh, once we construct this building in a single location. It also reduce efforts related to the approval process from boards such as historic preservation, urban design, area commissions, and zoning. Um, this, uh, considering all these operating costs, the building will eliminate the need for operating and maintenance of several facilities, including Carolyn and Piedmont uh, Avenue. We will eventually be getting out of both of those as well as the Beacon Building. So we'll combine all of this in one location. We'll be able to get rid of those very inefficient and older buildings and then repurpose those buildings uh, for out in the private sector. Uh, we're contemplated at this point the Carolyn and Piedmont Avenue complex and the Beacon building once vacated will eventually be sold. Um, it also allows us for something that we've really been working on for decades here, which is to complete the City Hall campus with a final building and a parking structure that will allow us to take care of the parking needs. And then of course the green space which will beautify and uh, provide a wonderful place for our employees and visitors to uh, sit outside and enjoy lunch and enjoy their breaks. Um, we also are going to build a companion garage with 707 parking spaces. This will be at the northwest corner of North Front Street and West Long Street. Um, we want to ensure ease and convenience to the folks that are going to be visiting the new building and the new one-stop shop. So we plan this garage in a manner that makes it very easy for those businesses and customers to come into the garage and then get over to the building and then get back out uh, to do their work. We've included many stakeholders in this process, uh, process such as Building and Services Review Committee, committee as well as a lot of the users that have been out there. We've also, we went to the downtown commission that unanimously approved uh, both the garage and uh, the building, the administrative facility when we went in front of the downtown commission. 
Uh, we formally advertised uh, this bid on vendor services on, uh, from May 18th, 2015 to June 17th of 2015. And as you know, because we spoke about this, the importance of this facility and the size of the project, we had in February, the city held two informational meetings to inform potential contractors of the scope of the project, also to ensure that they were familiar with the city's new construction front end documents and the pre-qualification process. Uh, we also in May held what we would normally hold, which is a uh, pre-bid meeting to allow for questions and to review again the city's new construction front end documents and the pre-qualification process. On June 17th, we received four responses to our bid. We estimate the notice to proceed date is gonna be July 24th, 2015. Uh, after we chose the alternates to be included in the contract, the bid amount from each company uh, was as follows. Messer Construction, $73,158,185. Turner Construction Company, $74,471,810 or $810. RW Sutherland Building Company, 74,852,499. And then a uh, joint venture with Gutenek uh, Mascaro, $75,940,916.54. I think it says something that even though there is a spread in those bids, that those bids are really pretty close when you look at a, what we had estimated to be anywhere between a 73 and $75 million project. And I think that speaks to the design process uh, with Schooley Caldwell and Design Group, our, our team that have been working on this to have those bids come in as close as they did. We're asking that the award be made to Messer, which a uh, construction company has the lowest, uh, most responsive, responsible and best bidder. Uh, the amount of that contract, as I mentioned earlier, 73,750,000. As you know, we're asking for 74 million. That'll include a contingency amount of uh, $591,815, as well as uh, some funds that we have in here to provide for temporary parking for the Bureau of Workers' Compensation. As you know, that's who we're purchasing the property from to build the garage, and we're building permanent spaces for the uh, Bureau of Workers' Compensation. And as a part of that agreement, we have uh, agreed to provide them with parking during the construction process. So there's 250,000 that's also in there as a maximum amount for that uh, parking. And that's how we get to the overall $74 million. And then I wanna speak very quickly about the waiver that we have in here. Uh, it's really, I see it as a technical uh, waiver. Uh, as you know, we advertised uh, this project on vendor services and we had all four vendors that I mentioned uh, presented bids. And then the city code chapter 329.20H5 states that bidders shall bid one subcontractor for each portion of work to be subcontracted. And because of the complexity of this project and the fact that there were 25 alternates listed in the bid, Bidders were getting prices from subcontracts up, subcontractors up to just before when the bid was due. This resulted in all bidders not submitting clean list of subcontractors per the code where only one subcontractor was identified for a portion of work or if there were multiple subcontractors for a portion of work, a price breakdown was not provided. Some bidders also listed subcontractors but did not provide a contract amount. And uh, because of this is why we're asking for the waiver. And uh, we also believe that with the language that we're asking for and the clarification in the code that will speak very specifically to those various lines within the bid document and make it very clear that anytime there's multiple subcontractors listed that we need to know what the describe that portion of the work that each subcontractor is gonna do and be sure to include the dollar total is sub, uh, associated with that portion of work that we will no longer have this issue. And again, we'll keep hammering at home in these pre-bids. Uh, but at least in that case, we will not have to waive competitive bidding because we believe that the, the language will be clear enough that if someone does not provide the, the needed information that we would then be able to rule them non-responsive. Uh, which we were not gonna be able to do based on the current language according to the city attorney's office. So 
the fact that all bidders incorrectly submitted list of subcontractors and we believe that Messer Construction's bid otherwise conformed to all the other uh, provisions of Chapter 329 and they were the lowest bid. I am asking for Council's approval for a waiver on this ordinance to go with the lowest, most responsive and responsible bidder. And again, the total for this project will be uh, 74 million. That's what we'll ask for. And that includes our contingency and that 250,000 for the parking. So we're not happy that we have to waive here, but we do believe that now that we've worked with the city attorney's office that we have language in place that uh, will uh, allow us to avoid this issue in the future. And we're gonna ask for that ordinance to be passed as an emergency so that uh, any other bids that go out, we'll have that new language in place immediately upon passage uh, so that we won't have to waive uh, or hope not have, we always have issue, issues that sometimes have us waiving competitive bidding, but it's not the way we like to do business. And you know, we've talked about that in the past, so. Thank you, Director. And um, one, I'm glad that, I mean, obviously the first ordinance that we talked about was really to deal with this issue. Because as you know, we certainly don't want to have to waive competitive bidding, especially when we're talking about a bid that's $74 million. But I think that because one, it is a new process. And because I know that, as you just mentioned, you've had significant meetings to try to, um, to share the changes that are happening that, that took, occurred with the new process. Um, but however, all four of the individuals that submitted bids all had the same issue. So, I, so I, that makes, so I, get, I understand why then we would want to, one, we're gonna fix the problem so this won't happen again. And it, should it ever happen again, then it would be those companies, as you said, would be, would be deemed non-responsive because we've changed the language so we don't have this again. And I would hope that as you were doing the bid, um, the bid conferences, that this would really become a high, you know, that we would just focus on this part. Again, we need to make sure that we don't have this issue moving forward because at this point it would be subject to being non-responsive. And we're, we're adjusting all of those front end documents and all of the forms that ask for the subcontractors to conform to the language that we're asking uh, for in the code, the, the change that I spoke to earlier. So it should be very, very clear how we're asking for the information and how that information needs to be reported to us. And uh, we will keep making sure that we bring that up at every pre-bid so that folks know what the expectations are. We don't wanna rule anyone non-responsive, especially a low bidder, uh, just because of a fact that they didn't understand the process. So we're gonna keep hammering that home to make sure that folks understand what information we're asking for and how we want them to present that information. Thank you. Um, I, I, as you mentioned, in terms of the bid amounts, this just goes to prove that having uh, an, a company work with us, like in this company, um, Schoolie, Schoolie Caldwell worked with us to be able to be within the amount that we had anticipated to pay for this building. So now that we've talked about really the waiver of competitive bidding, um, this will be an exciting building for Columbus and for um, the developers, because certainly, and anyone who's doing business within these departments, as you mentioned, to be able to have a one-stop shop. They don't have to go all over the city to do their business. They can do it in one place, which makes you know, economic development even stronger for the city of Columbus. But anyone who has to come to, to use any of those departments and make it a lot easier for them. And having a parking garage where they can come in and easily park will also is ease of business for those individuals. So those are all pluses to this. I'm also excited that we're looking at this being a, a silver lead building and um, a, a green rooftop that just continue to um, have one to be green, but also to look, think about the um, uh, being efficient and being um, being green and just I think that's that's great for the city. Uh, I would hope that I mean, maybe on when we have this on the hearing on the 24th and possibly we could make sure that if you could just have maybe even a slide to show what this building's gonna look like. I think you have all that information. Absolutely. I think that would be helpful because this is a significant 
this is a significant investment. And so I think if you could if you show a few slides when we get to this, I think that would also be very helpful, not only to the council, but also to the, to the, to the viewing audience to be able to see what we, what's, what, what we are planning to do for the residents of our city. And we'll make sure that we have those. Okay. All right. Well, other than that, um, I think you've um, certainly have provided this information to me in a way that I certainly am supportive of this and um, certainly supportive of the waiver of competitive bidding since we have now put, going to put the legislation to fix the issue. And again, all four of them had the same issue and we want to, and we don't want us, we want to keep moving this building forward. We don't want to hold it up and have to go back and re, and rebid this when we know that this is within the amount and we did give it to the lowest and most lowest bidder. So thank you for your presentation. Okay. And the next uh, two ordinances I have do not uh, have ordinance numbers yet, but we're going to present them anyway, just to make sure that we have them in front of you in, in this hearing. Uh, the first is it's going to offer, authorize the finance and management director to enter into a contract on behalf, again, of the construction management, office of construction management with General Restoration Corporation. And this will be for the renovation of the exterior envelope for the Columbus uh, Public Health Building at 240 Parsons Avenue. We did solicit formal bids for this project, and uh, we're going to recommend that the bid be made to the most responsive and responsible bidder, and that's General Restoration Corporation. Uh, the cost of this contract is estimated to be $509,100, and this is available within our uh, capital improvement uh, fund, and we have it set aside for this project. So we're excited about this. As you know, we do work on behalf of the health department in regard to their facilities. So this is a much needed project to uh, deal with some issues with the uh, exterior of that facility, and you know that is a historical facility. So. We want to make sure that we take care of the exterior so that we can protect the interior. Thank you. And certainly, because we serve many residents in that facility, and want to continue to do that and want them to be in a safe facility. So thank you for that legislation. Uh, again, the next does not have a current ordinance number, but will. Uh, it's the, this will authorize finance management director to enter in a contract, again, on the behalf of the Office of Construction Management. This is with Ryder Company. Inc. for services related to window replacement at various fire stations. Uh, the fire stations are fire station number six at 5750 Maple Canyon Avenue, fire station number 15 at 800 Livingston Avenue, fire station number 22 at 3039 Parsons Avenue, and fire station number 25 at 739 Third Avenue. Uh, these will be new commercial grade aluminum windows. They'll be thermally insulated for energy conservation. As you know, a lot of our fire stations are older fire stations and uh, we've been trying to update these window systems uh, in order to provide a more efficient uh, building and again save money on utility cost. Uh, we did solicit formal bids. We received two bids on June 17th, 2015, Ryder Company at 293500 and 2K General at $294,003. So we're recommending again to go with the lowest, most, re most responsive and responsible bidder, and that's the writer company for the 293,500. Uh, we're gonna put 30,000 in here for a contingency when we're dealing with these older stations. So the total amount of the ordinance is 323,500. Thank you for your commitment to continue to be energy efficient. Thank you. And then the last ordinance I have uh, is a, will again authorize the finance and management director through the Office of Construction Management uh, to enter into contract with Palmetto Construction Services for renovation of the existing storm and sanitary drain system at the Division of Police Precinct 18 at 1120 Morse Road. You may remember that this is a facility we recently purchased. We did replace the roof. Uh, as a part of that project, we realized that the drain systems uh, that were leading from the roof and, and into uh, the grounds around this facility were inefficient. We already have a contractor on site. We don't have contingency funds left, so we're asking uh, City Council to allow us to modify this contract and add $8,434.94 to this project to allow us to finish the project off and to ensure that uh, the new roof works properly and that the drains around the building uh, work properly so that uh, this uh, 
precinct 18 can function in the manner in which we, we want it to function. And then I have one last ordinance. I thought there was, that was it, but there's one more. Again, to allow the finance and management director to enter into a contract on behalf of our Office of Construction Management. Uh, this is gonna be with Newcomer Concrete. This is for pavement restoration at two fire stations, fire station number one at 300 North 4th Street and fire station number 29 at 5151 Little Turtle Way. Uh, these re renovations are necessary. We're gonna restore the deteriorated north driveway at fire station number one and the east driveways of fire station number 29. It's uh, the project will include, but it's not limited to concrete driveways, sidewalks and curb ramps. Uh, we received bids and uh, we've had a chance to evaluate those bids at the time this, the, we put this on the sheet. We had not had a chance to evaluate the bids, but Newcomer Concrete, uh, 210,000 gallon, 279,513. Procon, 249,000, 249, and then Columbus Asphalt, 239,000. So we recommend going with the most uh, responsive and responsible bidder, and that's uh, and lowest, which is Newcomer Concrete. So again, 210,000, uh, we go with Newcomer Concrete to do this work at two fire stations. Thank you. And I know that since you, I know when it says the vendor to be determined vendor, just haven't had a chance to go back and put, because you hadn't gotten the bids yet to put the, the, the name newcomer in. To That's this correct. Document. And then I went back today and followed up and made sure that they had had a chance to evaluate the bids and newcomer is the lowest, most uh, responsible and responsive. And that's who we'll be going with. Thank you. Thank you, Director. I um, now would like to turn over to our Treasurer, Debbie Klee. Good, good evening. Good evening, Chair Tyson. This evening, the Treasurer's Office has one ordinance. It's 1724 2015, which uh, seeks to authorize the City Treasurer to modify and extend its contract with First Data Government Solutions for the electronic bill payment services. The uh, Treasurer's Office holds the contract for all city agencies except the Income Tax Division. And um, the current contract expires September 1st of this year. In April, the Treasurer's Office went out to bid for um, an e-government, uh, e-payment solution uh, citywide. And at the present time, the, um, it, it was in April, and we are still evaluating the bid responses. So we ask that um, the contract be modified and extended for an additional six months through the end of February of 2016 to allow the committee to complete its work. Um, also, no additional resources will be required for this contract. All right, thank you. And, um I certainly will approve of it being extended and look forward to um, the new bids coming in and if we have a, a, different, per, a different company or not. But thank you, thank you, because we, we certainly do not want to hinder any of the work, that, the fine work that your office is doing. So yes, I would be supportive of extending the contract. Thank you. And our next presenter will be Ms. Mindy Frank from the auditor's office. Thank you, I just compliment, I have to compliment Mindy okay. and on camera that I serve on the Ohio Municipal League's board and all I can tell you is that they are constantly singing her praises for the work that she's been doing around the municipal income tax work. So can, thank you for doing the work on behalf of not only the city of Columbus but cities across Ohio. Thank you. Thank you for your kind words. Um, Council Member Tyson, we appreciate the um, opportunity for providing additional information on Ordinance 1725, uh, which authorizes the Columbus City Auditor to enter into contract with First Data Government Solutions uh, with regard to the e-file e-pay um, service that has been provided to us by that company for the last 10 years, facilitated by an original one-year contract and council granted permission to extend annually for nine consecutive years. At this time, the division is seeking a one-year term in light of the treasurer's pending RFP for e-payment services, and it is for this reason that we have requested a bid waiver on um, this contract. Uh, pending is the operative word here, uh, as the division's final term with first data will expire at the end of August. Uh, 
It is necessary to continue the existing services to ensure that there's a seamless transition to the new service provider if indeed there is someone awarded other than First Data Government Solutions. Until a new provider is named and the processes are established uh, to ensure no interruption of the income tax e-file e-pay services, it's necessary to continue with the entity that designed and currently hosts our present application. We are billed on a per transaction basis. Uh, there has been no increase in the um, assessment per transaction for this term of the contract. Um, also built into the total contract amount is sufficient funding for modification or improvements uh, to the application, which have been ongoing during the entire course of our relationship with First Data. Uh, just for some additional information, in 2014, a total of 305,169 transactions processed payments totaling $467,614,965.65 for $21,163 distinct accounts. Um, so far, uh, at the end of May of this year, the application has facilitated the deposit of $214,780,469.76. So this is an efficient way to process payments that are coming into the city for income tax. And we would request your support for this bid waiver situation with a one-year contract with First Data. Thank you. And certainly, um, you would have my support and um, the extension. And those are some pretty significant numbers you just shared that um, with me and the viewing and listening audience, because I think that you said the key is that it's an efficient way to be able to receive those dollars. And so I thank you for your work and certainly um, would be, a, I would, I'm in, I'm in for approval of your legislation. Thank you. Thank you. And our the final speaker this evening will be from the Department of Columbus Public Health, Mr. Roger Clarin. Good, good evening. Good evening. Uh, we have eight pieces of legislation to review tonight. Uh, first piece is Ordinance 1699. It's to accept and appropriate a grant for monitoring of Ebola travelers. Uh, this ordinance authorizes the Board of Health to accept a grant from the Ohio Department of Health originating from the Centers for Disease Control. This ordinance will appropriate $52,217.81 uh, for Ebola monitoring of travelers for the period of December 22, 2014 through June 30, 2015. And Roger, I know that we are, we are constantly monitoring the, the travelers. And so my question is, um, we think we'll be receiving additional funding from the um, Ohio Department of Health. Kind of, this is ending June 30th. So, and I know it's an ongoing process. So, what are your thoughts about yeah, that? It ended June 30th because it's tied to uh, the normal cycle for emergency preparedness grants. Uh, yes, we'll continue to get new money starting July 1st. Uh, you don't know the amount. Uh, they they decided uh, basically statewide it was going to be about. $100,000 at the start of this, and they um, calculate the amount for each local health district by the percent of travelers that each district has. We had about two-thirds of all state travelers, so we received roughly two-thirds of the dollars that were established. We do not know the overall state amount for the upcoming year, but they have said that um, locals will continue to get some funding. Okay. Thank you. The next piece is Ordinance 1746, and it will authorize a sec security camera ma maintenance contract. Uh, we're in need of maintenance services for our closed circuit security cameras and to maintain interfaces with our matrix card readers and panic buttons at our 240 Parsons Avenue facility. Uh, this contract was publicly solic solicited between June 15th and June 19th, 2015. Um, this will authorize a contract with KNS Services for $28,500 for the period June 1st, 2015 through May 31st, 2016. Our next piece is Ordinance 1747, and it's to accept and appropriate a supplemental grant uh, funds for the 2015 Ryan White program. Uh, we had previously been awarded a grant from uh, the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. 
uh, Ordinance 0548, 2015, authorized the acceptance and appropriation of $3,494,730 in grant funds. This ordinance is needed to accept and appropriate an additional $851,297 to fund the Ryan White uh, HIV Care Part A program through February 29th, 2016. Uh, the HIV Care Part A grant's purpose is to improve access to medical care for persons living with HIV or AIDS living in Central Ohio. And, and thank you. Um, we are very appreciative to continue to receive these dollars on behalf of HIV and AIDS, AIDS patients living in our community. And I know that um, these are dollars that we certainly aren't even going out and we're soliciting. It's just because our numbers are pretty significant um, around this particular um, disease. And so I'm hopeful that, one, that we ne definitely need to make sure that people have access to medical care so that um, that if they have HIV, it doesn't go to, to AIDS, if they're getting the proper medical care that they need to continue to have productive lives. But and I'm certainly hoping that these dollars will begin to certainly be used to be able to um, to continue to help people of color because we know that those are that's the largest growing population in our community that are contracting HIV and AIDS. And so we need to make sure that they certainly have access to health care and um, so they don't continue to spread the illness. And just and I'm also very appreciative. I mean, like I said, I'm appreciative we're, we're getting these dollars to support the residents in our community. Unfortunately, it's just we're getting them because we're still having more incidents of this disease in our community. So. Hopefully we'll continue to raise awareness and do the things necessary to, um, to prevent individuals from contracting the illness. So thank you for um, sharing the legislation. Uh, Ordinance 1769, 2015 is to accept the Child and Family Health Services Grant Award. Uh, we have been awarded a grant from the Ohio Department of Health for $818,022 in grant money and fee revenues to fund the CFHS grant for the period July 1, 2015 through June 30, 2016. This grant coordinates services among agencies that provide perinatal services to children and women of childbearing age, including public health nursing services and Ohio infant mortality reduction initiatives. Uh, the public health problems that the grant will address are high smoking rates, especially among pregnant women, uh, high rates of overweight children in Franklin, uh, Franklin County, high infant mortality rates with significant racial disparities, and high incident of sleep-related infant deaths. Uh, in 2000, the period just ending, we served 156 families in 15 zip codes, and in the upcoming year, we hope to serve 180 families. This is we. Again, I'm very appreciative of this legislation, too, because of the, the information you just shared with us, how important this is for children to live, live past their first birthday, children not to be having um, obesity, um, childhood obesity, which can turn to diabetes. So I appreciate that we're getting these dollars to be able to do preventive services um, as well as um, health care services to help women and children. Thank you. Kind of tied to that previous uh, piece of legislation is Ordinance 1770, which is to authorize a contract with City Match. Um, City Match uh, uh, is part of the CFHS grant, um, and it's going to be a contract for $40,000 um, to provide for the provision of leadership for the Ohio Institute for Equity and Birth Outcomes, and again, and for $40,000 from July 1st, 2015 through July through June 30th, 2016. Uh, they're uh, looking for two main projects, models. One is the community connector and one is the family planning access and education. And in 2016, the uh, community uh, connector plans to train 20 uh, individuals. Additionally, the family planning access and education program will work to standardize family planning curriculum and subsidize the cost of long active reversible contraceptive, otherwise known as LARCs, for those on the south side who cannot afford them. Uh, staff is estimating that we'll provide, uh, be able to provide this to 40 south side residents. Thank you. 
Our next piece is Ordinance 1775 and is to authorize the modification of contract with Ohio Support Services Corporation. Uh, Ordinance 0317-2015 authorized the Board of Health to enter into a contract with Ohio Support Services contract in the amount of $340,000 for security services for the period March 1, 2015 through February 28, 2016. This ordinance is needed to increase contract EL016706 in the amount of $8,446 for a total contract amount not to exceed $348,446. Um, this modification is needed to meet the demand for security services at various WIC clinics. Do you have any, can you share with me why the, 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 to meet the demand for security services, has the demand gotten higher at the WIC clinics? Well, currently there is about four or five standalone sites and uh, there is just a decision to um, add security services on a rotating basis to those facilities. All right, thank you. Ordinance 1781 is to accept and appropriate uh, a grant from Franklin County Department of Jobs and Family Services and, and to enter into contracts with Paul Worth Associates and Gatehouse Media Partners. Columbus Public Health has been awarded a grant from Franklin County Department of Jobs and Family Services originating from the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. This ordinance is needed to accept and appropriate $710,500 in grant monies for the period July 14, 2015 through September 30th, 2015 to implement campaigns and initiatives for Celebrate One to ensure positive, better birth outcomes. This ordinance authorizes and directs the Board of Health to enter into a $560,500 contract with Paul Worth Associates for the period July 14th, 2015 through September 30th, 2015 to continue the work on the branding rollout of Celebrate One. Additionally, this ordinance authorizes and directs the Board of Health to modify, increase, and extend a contract EL015624 with Gatehouse Media Partners Incorporated for the time period ending September 30, 2015 in the amount of $150,000 for a total contract amount not to exceed $314,200. This modification is needed to provide continued work on the Safe Sleep campaign. Thank you. And our final piece is 1784 and is to authorize a contract with Access Health Columbus. Uh, the Board of Health has a need for the coordination of efforts to improve primary care for the most vulnerable in Greater Columbus. This ordinance authorizes the Board of Health to enter into a contract with Access Health Columbus doing business as Healthcare Collaborative of Greater Columbus. For the coordination of improvement activities with local federally qualified health centers and other community-based organizations to benefit those most vulnerable in Greater Columbus. This contract is for the period June 1, 2015 through May 31, 2016, an amount not to exceed $25,000. This contract is designed to address three improvement activities, convening and hosting a navigator and certified application counselor learning group, convening and hosting a FQHC senior leadership group, and three, to improve the coordination of care across the medical neighborhood. Thank you, and this legislation, even though the dollar amount certainly isn't isn't as significant as some others, but just the work of this legislation is critically important because we are serving our most vulnerable persons. And when you're serving them, certainly hosting a navigator and certified application counselor learning group is really important because individuals who are within, who are quite vulnerable with their health care, need to have a navigator to help them to be able to move forward with their. Um, health challenges and any other challenges they may have. Um, also, the convening of the Federal Qualified Health Center Leadership Group, just for them to be working together collaboratively to, to make sure that individuals at one fairly federally qualified health center may be providing some services that maybe another one isn't, and so that they can then utilize their resources better. And then lastly, I mean, again, just the, the care and coordination um, across all neighborhoods is critically important. So those dollars will be well spent to be able to help our community. So thank you for sharing that this evening. And 
Uh, we do not have any speaker slips. And so with that, I will get ready to uh, adjourn this hearing. And I hope that this hearing has provided insight into the programs and community initiatives from Columbus Public Health, as well as the ordinances and finance that are necessary to support our ongoing city operations. As residents, these hearings are an opportunity for you to learn and become engaged in issues that affect that have been presented that affect you as a resident. And before I conclude, I want to, to thank the individuals who presented tonight. First of all, I want to thank Director Rakowski, I want, who's our finance director, our treasurer, Ms. Debbie, Deborah Klee, um, Ms. Mindy Frank, and Mr. Roger Cloran from the, Mindy from the Otter's office and Roger Cloran from the um, health department. Also, I always thank my fellow council members and their staffs who really work hard to serve our community with pride every day. I want to thank my city council legislative research office, um, especially Tom Diamond, who staffs health and human services and workforce development committees, and then Kate Pashadi, who staffs the finance committee. Then my staff that's here with me, um, Nicole Harper and James Lewis, and certainly my intern that's here this summer, um, Mr. Jordan Harrison, for the work that they're doing. Um, I also want to thank CTV because we certainly wouldn't be able to provide this information to our residents without them, and I thank them for being here on pretty much every other Tuesday with me. And then lastly, the residents of Columbus. And just want to say thank you for allowing uh, me to be in this role to be able to provide information to you and work for you each and every day. And this, you are the best residents in the country, and this is the greatest city in the country. So thank you for... Um, for tuning in and learning about the legislation. Have a great evening, everyone. Thank you.